we have today an absolutely grand hero of consciousness, a deep thinker, philosopher, scientist, Dr. Bernardo Castrop. He's born to Danish and Portuguese parents in Rio de Janeiro. He's a great scientist, a philosopher, and a great thinker who's developing uh, profound ideas, uh, bringing them to the public knowledge and to the scientific and philosophical community. He's been speaking on many, many levels, and our listeners on this discussion are mostly familiar with the idea of consciousness and its importance. For those who are joining us new uh, and fresh, I'd like to just highlight a couple of points, uh, Dr. Kastrup, if you don't mind, just to say that today's discussion about ultimate reality has a very great importance in terms of the consequences of how we live our life, how we understand the nature of things and what we can do about it. So it has a theoretical aspect, but it is also very practical in terms of understanding life and living and the meaning of life and what to do about it, even in terms of our personal life, as well as society and world peace, the environment, because it is through consciousness that we see everything, experience everything, make decisions, and change our reality in a very profound way. So Dr. Kastrup, whom I will be calling Bernardo, based on his permission to do that, has even created a foundation, Essentia Foundation, uh, to promote this knowledge and understanding of the reality of life to the public, not just in philosophical circles and scientific circles, but get the public informed about the reality and nature of existence, of being. Uh, usually we see things through our senses. We have seen that the senses are not always reliable. We've had a scientific revolution with Galileo showing that the Earth is not flat and it doesn't get the whole universe rotate around it, but that there is a different reality than what our senses have shown. Einstein has shown us this time and space are relative. Quantum mechanics has shown us that there is uncertainty, superposition, non-local events. And so all that we have so deeply confirmed that is reality through our senses doesn't mean to doesn't doesn't seem to stand doesn't seem to hold and so what is then ultimate reality it could be either mental or physical the physical seems to be shaky the mental is one supposition and that is where the idealists go those who believe that ultimately there is consciousness there is awareness and then how awareness manifests is a different different problem that we would like to look at from different perspectives with Bernardo uh, today. So welcome, Bernardo. Uh, there are many things we can discuss. Let us address first, what are the general feelings about why materialism is baloney, which is your, your late, one of your latest books. We'll just take this to keep it behind us and then go to some of the dynamics of how consciousness can appear as matter and why does it do that? So materialism um, is untenable for a number of reasons. One of them is internal uh, contradiction. It defines matter as something that is outside and independent of consciousness and has no inherent qualities and then tries to explain the qualities of experience in terms of something that was defined as having nothing to do with experience. And then it fails to do that and we all wonder why did it fail well because it's an internal contradiction this is not a problem to be solved it's just uh, uh, the sign that we've taken the wrong path in our rational thinking about what things might be another reason is that uh, it sort of chases its own tail it tries to explain consciousness in terms of an abstraction of consciousness namely this world outside and independent of mind uh, it fails on the empirical uh, uh, um, level as well. Um, physics or foundations of physics have now been showing for over 40 years that every time we assume that uh, physical entities have standalone existence, 
experiments show that that's not the case. The results have consistently contradicted this assumption for over 40 years, despite repeated experiments, ever more refined experiments with ever less uh, uh, loopholes. And the latest one in 2015 or 18, arguably have no loopholes. So if it's not the case that um, physical entities have standalone existence, then materialism cannot be true because that's one of the assumptions of uh, materialism or physicalism. Uh, on the neuroscientific uh, side of things, uh, we now have cataloged a, a vast array of uh, particular circumstances in which uh, significant decreases or impairments of normal brain function or brain activity go hand in hand with an explosion in the richness and intensity of experience and materialism would have predicted precisely the opposite. And the opposite is what happens most of the times, fair enough. Uh, but there are these, these other uh, types of phenomena, very extensive. Uh, uh, the results of experimentation done under controlled laboratory conditions in which subjects are instrumented with an EEG cap or put inside a functional brain scanner and they report on their experiences while neuroscientists are measuring vastly reduced brain activity, for instance, with the application of psychedelics, that's one case, but also uh, uh, um, lack of oxygen to the brain, brain injury, uh, degenerative brain diseases, all of this can lead to actually enhance, not all the time, most of the times not, but there are uh, documented situations in which all of this can lead to enhanced uh, conscious inner life. And there are many other reasons, but I'll stay, I'll stay with these. So as a starting point, we are starting on a platform that consciousness is primary, and that is the true ontology of reality. So we're starting with consciousness. And therefore, we have to a little bit define consciousness. Um, how would you define consciousness for the general public? Consciousness is that whose excitations are the experiences we have. It's the sine qua non of experience. Consciousness is raw subjectivity, the field of subjectivity in which our experiences unfold. So I don't mean to equate, to equate conscious with higher level mental functions, but only with raw basic experience. So consciousness is a broad aspect. So we live our lives through consciousness. Without consciousness, we cannot love, we cannot understand, we cannot experience anything. And for us humans, consciousness is the most important aspect of what, what we know and our own reality. If we were to come back to Descartes and uh, dualism uh, idea and his, uh, you know, demon who would say like, I can mix up all your world. And he really was less than what we have today in knowledge. He, he, as well as many others, came to the conclusion that there is one thing that is sure, and that is we are conscious, and that he says, if I am conscious, therefore I exist. So consciousness is really primary, and at that time, with less knowledge, they were thinking, okay, there could be two values, there could be consciousness and the material world, that's what we call dualism, but today, and many others, like throughout time, the Advaita Vedanta, the, even some of the Buddhist understanding, if we go to Parmenides and go Spinoza and Leibniz, they have different forms. And uh, Bernardo is also telling us that Carl Jung and Schopenhauer, they had this idealistic perspective. So can we enlarge the understanding of consciousness beyond what a human consciousness is, which means there is consciousness uh, that is sensing, experiencing, detecting, not just a thought process or not, as you call it also yourself, meta consciousness, which means to be conscious of oneself. But all of these other values are also consciousness. Can we include in consciousness all of these phenomena of experience? According to the, the definition I just gave, that that's what is meant by consciousness. Technically, uh, we refer to it as phenomenal consciousness, uh, which is just the basis of raw experience, uh, that inner space of subjectivity or even the outer space, a space of subjectivity where experiences unfold 
as patterns of excitation of consciousness. So consciousness in that sense doesn't mean your consciousness alone or my consciousness alone or the consciousness of my cat alone. It means a type of existent, an ontological category, which is a technical term for it. Uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, people used to refer to it as a kind of substance but the word substance didn't have the purely material connotations that it has today. Substance literally, literally meant that which stands under, substance, which means the type of existence. What is the essence of the thing you're talking about? So consciousness is a kind of essence. Arguably, not arguably for sure, the only essence we know by direct acquaintance. All other essences like material essence or informational essence, everything else that is postulated, spiritual essence, all of those are theoretical abstractions. They are uh, concepts that arise in our theory-making minds, but we do not have direct acquaintance with any of those. Even the physicality of our own body uh, is constituted of experiences in consciousness. If you didn't have those, those experiences, you wouldn't be talking about a body at all. Um, so it's in that sense a type of existence that an idealist means by consciousness. Therefore, when an idealist says everything is consciousness, the idealist is not saying that everything is your consciousness or my consciousness. That would be solipsism, and idealists are not solipsists. What the idealist means is that there is a world out there outside my mind, your mind, outside my consciousness and your consciousness, an objective world that does whatever it does, regardless of what we think about it. It will do what it does, if, even if we don't like it, even if we wish it to be different, and it would continue to do it even if we were not around to observe it doing whatever it's doing. But that objective world out there is also essentially consciousness. In other words, it belongs in the same ontological category. It's the same type of existence as my mind. It's not my mind, but it's mind, a transpersonal mind out there. So uh, you use the term objective. Um, do you mean like there is an objective realism or should we separate this objective realism from objective realism? I think you mentioned this in one of your books uh, that David Chalmers had said like this. I think it was in, in Decoding Carl Jung where uh, there is potentially objects that are like mathematical objects or entities that exist out there and that is objective realism whereas subjective realism is the fact subjective idealism also is that there is an experiencer that is experiencing something that is an interaction in some way independent of the existence of objects in that consciousness when I used the word obje objective world, I meant it in a much simpler way. I meant that the world does whatever it does independently of our personal subjective states. In other words, what, the, what nature does does not depend on my wishes, my fears, my likes and dislikes, uh, my fantasies. It doesn't depend on any of that. So it is objective from my perspective. But I believe nature is subjective from its own perspective. Um, now, if it's, this is difficult to understand, let's bring it down to two people because it's exactly the same problem. Your thoughts, from my perspective, are objective to me. I have no control over them. I cannot influence them directly. You'll be having whatever thoughts you have, regardless of what I'm thinking about it or well, what I'm feeling about it or even whether I know about your thoughts or not. So from my perspective, your thoughts are objective. But from your per perspective, they are subjective. Now extend this to the world at large, to nature at large. I think nature is from its own first person perspective in and of itself, it is subjective. It is a mind, but from my perspective, observing nature, its processes are objective because they don't depend on whether I like them or not. I do think there is an objective world in that sense which presents itself to our observation as what we call the physical world. But I think physicality is just an appearance. It's what we register upon measuring the world. It's not the world as it is in itself, just like what you see on the dashboard of dials of an airplane is the result of measuring the sky outside. 
but it is not the sky outside. I think the dashboard is equivalent to the physical world. The physical world is not the thing in itself. It's the outcome of measurement. It's like the dashboard. Um, but I do believe there is a sky outside. There is a mental world out there. Now, the, uh, the, what we were alluding to is um, the seeming contradiction or the seeming opposition between Barclay's subjective idealism and the more modern streams of objective idealism like Schopenhauer. Uh, and the difference is the following. Under objective idealism, uh, there is really a world out there independent of my subjectivity. That world is subjective from its own perspective, but it is not my subjectivity. So there is stuff happening out there, um, which presents itself to us as what, what we see, feel, smell, and so forth. Um, subjective idealism is the notion that there is not really a world out there. It's all a dream. And it just happens that we are all having mutually consistent dreams in our own minds. Our perceptions are not measurements of something outside. They are conjured up by our own minds. Uh, and it so happens that this conjuring up of a seeming world out there is mutually consistent across observers because God makes it so. That's, that's Bishop Barclay's uh, approach to idealism. Um, you might think that there is a true opposition here. In objective idealism, there is really a world out there which we measure and perceive. Um, and in subjective idealism, there is no obje objective world out there. It's just a set of mutually consistent dreams but there is God enforcing the consistency amongst those dreams. So in a sense, God is playing the role of the world outside. And if you look deeper into it, you realize that it's the same thing. Uh, it's just that Barclay spoke of God while objective idealists speak of nature. Um, but there is always, there has always to be something, some system, some structure outside the, quote, dreamers, that um, creates this mutual consistency across the worlds we think we perceive. Even if we are conjuring up those worlds, uh, there is some input from states that are outside the dreamers in order for this coordination to happen. And whether you call it God or call it nature, yeah, it depends on your taste and what you understand by the word God. I wouldn't call it God because I don't see nature as something that is self-reflective and has higher level mental functions. I regard it as something purely instinctive and regular and predictable. But uh, strictly speaking, there is no ultimate difference between subjective idealism and objective idealism. Would you separate this from Spinoza's God as a created like a different category than consciousness as if there is some personal entity which leads to pantheism rather than uh, consciousness is all there is i i don't think there is any difference in essence i think if i could go have a beer in the one of the canals of amsterdam with spinoza tomorrow and we would hash out the terminologies I think we would end the day saying, well, we actually agree. It's just the choice of words that is different. You have to keep in mind that uh, at the time of Spinoza in the 17th century, the word mind meant human mind because animals were not supposed to have mind. Black people were not supposed to have mind uh, back in that time. So every time somebody would talk about psyche in Greek, mente in Latin, um, it was implicit and well understood amongst the readers that that meant a human mind because only humans had mind. So when uh, Spinoza proposed his sort of multi-aspect uh, uh, monism, the idea that mind and matter are just aspects of a third kind of existence, which he called God, that uh, the essence of the world is, is God, is divineness, it's divine essence, which presents itself to us as matter or as human minds, depending on the perspective. When he proposed this, uh, I feel personally quite sure that what he meant by God is a minded entity. In other words, it is a mind. And human minds are an aspect of that universal mind, and so is matter. So I think if we hashed out the terminology, we would all, Espinosa and I would agree that we are both idealists. But if you read 
the words he wrote and you interpret those words under a modern perspective with a modern dictionary, then he did not say that the world was mental. He said that the world was made of divine stuff and that mind was one aspect of this divine stuff and matter was another. So you would have to, strictly speaking, call him a multi-aspect monist or a neutral monist and not an idealist. But I think he was an idealist, all right? Yeah. It's just you have to pay attention to what the words meant at different points in time. Yeah, so that was a historical uh, kind of reason, a little bit, and time and definition of terms. But ultimately, consciousness is the one aspect that is there. We don't have to create a third element, consciousness or matter, Correct. and then create a third element behind both so that kind of they appear as different. So we're coming to the true idealism. So if we want to unpack a little bit the reality, uh, we can say there is consciousness as an ocean of being, and then consciousness becoming conscious. Can we differentiate consciousness as an existence, pure existence, and to be conscious as an aspect of consciousness? And to be conscious then requires an observer and an observed. So even though it's all consciousness, but when consciousness by its nature looks at itself, it has to have an object of observation because what to be conscious would mean otherwise, if there is no observer who is conscious observing an object uh, that is uh, being part of what the awareness is about. And then we can add the connection between the observer and the observed. And here we have three elements, the observer, the process of observation and the observed, even though all are consciousness. Uh, can we look at it from this perspective? You are alluding to meta-consciousness, which is a particular configuration of consciousness. It means the following. If you are just phenomenally conscious, then you experience. But when you are meta-conscious, then in addition to experiencing the thing, it's, uh, the, the, whatever the experience is, you also experience the knowledge that you are experiencing. So not only do you experience, in addition to that, you know that you are experienced and that knowledge is itself an experience or a meta experience. That's when mind uh, uh, inspects its own content um, by re-representing its phenomenal contents to itself. This re-representation is like looking at experience through a mirror. It re-represents the contents of mind at a higher metacognitive level. Now, uh, is it possible that you are conscious without being meta-conscious? Of course, that's what you were when you were a baby. Even when you were a two-year-old child, that's what cats have. That's what most animals have. Maybe pachyderms and cetaceans have some higher level mental functions, but by and large, the rest of nature is conscious, but not meta-conscious. They experience, but they don't go around telling themselves, oh, I know that I am experiencing. This difference is crucial. Um, let me give you an example why. When we start thinking about something, it's like we are traversing an avenue of thoughts. Thoughts come, which link to other thoughts, and then these other thoughts come, and we experience them, and then other thoughts come, memories come. It's like you're going down a mental avenue, but we consider that to be all us. But when we are walking down a road, a real avenue, and houses come, and trees come, and people and cars come and go, we don't think that's us. We think that's out there. While both are essentially mental, it's a mental traversing, traversing. A traverse. Uh, even if you uh, believe or, or grant, like I do, that the street corresponds to the reality outside of your mind, even if you grant that, your experience of the street is yours. It's your mental world. Um, we make this difference between one and the other because of meta consciousness. If we were not meta conscious, instead of saying, I have hunger, we would say I am hunger because what exists to a non-meta conscious mind is the experience. So you are the experience. So if you're hungry, then you are hunger. 
But when we say, I have hunger, what we do is we re-represent the experience of hunger. We separate it from our core subjectivity. And we say, I am the subject who happens to be having that experience. I am not the experience. I am the experiencer. So this, this partition between the object, the thing experienced, even if it is internal, and the subject of experience that arises with metacognition. And that's something that has evolved over the eons uh, of you know, ecosystem adaptation on this planet. I don't think it's something that is there on the ground level of nature. Otherwise, bacteria would be metaconscious. Ants would be metaconscious. You know? uh, I, they don't seem to be. Um, at least we don't have any good reasons to believe they are. So that's an important distinction. It is entirely possible to be experiencing to be conscious without making any separation between your subjectivity and the experiences that you are undergoing. This separation between object and subject arises with the evolutionary development of metacognition. So there are all these layers of consciousness, therefore, as we started by saying, but in the process of saying that something is conscious, if we look at it from the outside, even though itself it doesn't recognize that there is an object, you do need some two values at least to say that there is a conscious process. Uh, it's, no. You don't Why? need that. Why would so you? It, it's a phenomenon then, it's a phenomenon that includes uh, two values. For example, you, we don't say that the bacteria is conscious of the food that is there and goes towards it, it is not metaconscious for sure. We do say it is conscious, but uh, in order to say that there is an interaction between the bacterium and the food to which it is attracted naturally by its own mechanisms, uh, we have to have two elements uh, that are uh, in that process of interaction, isn't it? Well, for that, for there to be a world outside our personal minds, there has to be an interaction. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about a world outside our personal minds. But the step that goes beyond is to say, well, for there to be consciousness, not for there to be a world, but for there to be any consciousness at all, you, you need two things that I disagree with. Uh, you can have experiences without separating yourself from the experience. As a matter of fact, that's what we do when we are kids. I remember... I, don't think, I think I was around nine years old when I started becoming cognizant that I was not the world around me. I wasn't the other people. I wasn't the trees and the houses and the cars. And I, I was astonished by that thought. My God, I am not all this stuff because up until that moment, I was my experiences. There wasn't this duality between subject and object. Uh, it's only uh, when we look back in retrospective that we attribute these this, uh, categories of uh, the subject and the world the subject was perceiving. So it's only in retrospect that we do that after we've developed metaconsciousness. But when you're very young, uh, you, you perceive something. Sure, of course, there are trees, there are cars, but your unspoken thought, your unspoken mode of, of awareness is, I am my experiences. You, you don't create that thought. I am the thing experiencing these other things. That thought doesn't come. You just sort of slide along with the flow of experiences as if you were those experiences. This is your experience. I mean, this is your experience and the lower, let's call it lower level of consciousness and the phenomenal consciousness, not the access consciousness just the phenomenal, not the meta consciousness. So in the pure phenomenal, even maybe subconscious level is also not subconscious. It's a form of consciousness as you beautifully describe. But if we want to analyze even from an outside looking at it, the dynamics of consciousness, there must be a dynamics of consciousness. Otherwise it's a flat, a flat entity. So in order to say, there is a phenomenal consciousness. There has to be a phenomenon, and the phenomenon requires a dynamic interaction between uh, 
not different entities. It doesn't have to be separate. It doesn't have to be material. It's consciousness interacting with itself in some dynamics. Otherwise, what would it be if everything is flat? There can be dynamics of consciousness without the subject-object separation. I think the motivation for your question is how can there be so much complexity and variety if there is only one thing going on? How can that thing experience complexity and variety if there is nothing outside of it for it to no, have No, even within it, even within it, it has to, it's consciousness interacting with itself. It's like you take gold and you make a ring out of it or you make a necklace or you make a statue. They're all different, but they are, of course, gold, if you like to say the essence of it is sure. gold. So, so the ultimate reality is consciousness. This we have agreed. But to start to say that consciousness is conscious, then this conscious aspect is a dynamic process and requires, therefore, conscious in what way? Like the, the boy who thinks the world is, is themselves and they melt with the world or the bacteria that has no idea uh, about the food, but it melts with the food. But there is still this difference between the one experience and the other. And that requires some dynamics, which require at least flavors that are different within consciousness. It may require, I agree with you, it requires dynamics, but the dynamics does not require the split between subject and object. I, I think you may be conflating the two things. Um, you can have a lake and it can ripple in infinite different ways. There are countless patterns of rippling on, right. on that lake. It can have whirlpools, it can have large ripples, small ripples, ripple going this way, that way, interfering constructively or destructively with one another, creating all kinds of 2D, even 3D patterns of excitation that are incredibly rich and incredibly complex and varied and dynamic. And yet there's only the lake because there's nothing to the ripples, but the lake, there is rippling. You cannot remove the rippling from the lake. The rippling is, is, is not outside the lake. It's not different from yeah. the lake. It's just, it, it just uh, it, it's what different patterns of excitation of the lake look like. And there can be infinite patterns of excitation, infinite varieties. And those varieties in the lake that consciousness is are the variety of experiences we have. But you can have that enormous, enormously complex, varied, dynamic um, multitude of patterns of experiences without the thought, I am the one having the experience or without the experience breaking itself apart into subject and object. You see what I mean? Yeah, so you yes, can have absolutely. all that dynamism without the, this, this dichotomy you're putting forward. Yeah, I mean, there is no question that there are layers of consciousness and there are levels in which you kind of are meta-conscious, that you are conscious of these phenomena and you have access consciousness and you are aware that, okay, there is Bernardo looking at uh, Tony and uh, speaking to him. This is a meta-consciousness. And suppose we don't have that meta-consciousness and we are doing it like on an automated way. So on an automated way, uh, let's say we just become zombies or whatever. <laughs> or a zombie would lack consciousness entirely. At all, yeah, but no, we that's could not be a... just conscious and not meta-conscious. Then, right. then we would be the experience of looking at one another. We would be, that's how we feel it. But the dynamics of consciousness looked at, as you say, from outside, from a meta-conscious individual, says, well, these two guys are looking at each other. And for each one, the other is the object of the other. And one is the observer, the other is the observed, but they don't know it, or they, they are not in that level of awareness to be able to appreciate. Yeah, but there is a dynamic. So the lake is the ripples, but in order to talk about ripples, uh, you have to talk about something. And maybe it's a question of semantics. We don't need to use object because object maybe lead to, uh, to the idea of physical entity or separation. It's not a separation. It's just that something dynamically is experiencing the other. And uh, even if it doesn't know, it melts with the other, which means the other takes over one's awareness because 
the, the, the Bernardo boy feels it is the world, fine, but Bernardo doesn't know, doesn't have the experience of self versus the world, and therefore the world takes over Bernardo's reality and becomes Bernardo's reality. Yet, for that to happen, there is an experience of some kind of flavor of difference, if you like, not real difference. I'm not entirely sure where you're trying to go, but just to make it clear what my position is, um, meta-consciousness entails the subject-object partitioning. It's what characterizes meta-consciousness. So if you look at the world and the people from a meta-conscious perspective, you will be applying that dichotomy. Uh, that dichotomy is even embedded in language. Language has subject and object in its structure uh, and has the dynamism of verbs, which are actions that unfold in time. So when we start talking or theorizing about something, that will be automatically there. It's the baggage we carry as symbolically thinking individuals that operate through conceptual reasoning. And then that, that's all presupposed by, well, it's necessary or presupposed, how to put it, that all presupposes meta-consciousness. Meta-consciousness is necessary for any of this to happen. But I understood the point you made earlier was that even if you're not meta-conscious, then there still has to be a subject-object duality. That I oppose. I don't think that's necessary at all. Uh, it is implied by meta-consciousness, but it doesn't need to be there at all configurations and levels of consciousness. I don't think it needs to be there. Well, one of the reasons I, I'm, <laughs> I wanted to know why I'm bringing this is that uh, in my concept of consciousness and in order to understand how the one consciousness, which is in idealism, the one reality, because we're not talking about panpsychism here or proto-consciousness, which means there are little bits of consciousness or elements of reality have consciousness and then they combine together in some mysterious way and they create a higher consciousness. So we have to explain how the one consciousness actually ends up appearing as many and rippling and all of that. And so one of the mechanisms by which it, uh, it does that is by its nature, this is in my mind and, and I would like to discuss it with you, by its nature as consciousness, what is the nature of consciousness? Is to be conscious. And to be conscious entails at least flavors of looking at itself from a perspective of observer and process and observe. I mean, now I you mean, say we are going the same, around the same point. I, I disagree. You don't need to agree with me, right. but if you're asking me if I agree with this, no, I don't. I explain why. So, so then let's let's leave it and go back to two questions. One is why does this one consciousness, if it is one in your perspective, why and how does it actually become many and manifest? Why? What is the reason? You discuss this in of, in both. Carl Jung and Schopenhauer's, and I wanted to know whether you are in agreement with both of them or you have a different point of view about it. Okay, so of, of the three main metaphysical alternatives we have on the table today, two of them suffer from insoluble problems, which are not really problems to be solved. They are reflections of internal contradictions. So materialism suffers from the hard problem of consciousness which is that there is nothing about physical parameters in terms of which we could deduce, at least in principle, the qualities of experience. These two domains are incommensurable, and that's the hard problem. And then the constitutive panpsychism, which you alluded to, is the idea that the structure of reality is the structure of physical entities. So the boundaries across physical entities are real boundaries at the foundation level of reality, but those physical entities have some kind of innate uh, irreducible uh, conscious states. And, uh, uh, and it is the combination of the conscious states of all the elementary subatomic particles making up my brain that somehow constitute my seemingly unitary uh, conscious inner life. Now, that suffers from another insoluble problem called the combination problem, which is that there is no coherent way to talk about fundamentally distinct fields of subjectivity combining to form a unified field of subjectivity. And that's the outcome of years of thinking about this by the entire, a large part of the community of analytic philosophy. 
And then you have idealism, which avoids both of the previous problems by saying, well, I don't need to reduce consciousness to matter, so I don't have the hard problem. And two, I already start with the universal consciousness, so nothing needs to combine, so I don't have the combination problem. But then the, 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 the opposition would say, well, but you have then the decomposition problem. If it's only one mind going on, how come I don't know what you're thinking right now? How, how come I don't know what's going on in the galaxy of Andromeda right now? It's all in one mind, right? So I shouldn't know all that. And that's called the decomposition problem. Now, this is not an insoluble problem for the very simple reason that nature gives us the solution. Uh, the solution is empirical. It's happening all the time. It's a psychiatric uh, phenomenon called dissociation. People with extreme forms of dissociation um, have multiple seemingly uh, disjoint centers of awareness, which psychiatry calls alters. And each alter has its own particular memories, its own personality traits, its own thoughts, opinions, proclivities, wishes. Um, sometimes they are aware of one another, sometimes they're not. Um, and when a people with the DID, dissociative identity disorder, uh, uh, dreams, one quarter of them, according to research from Harvard, um, experience their own dreams from multiple conscious perspectives. In other words, each alter partakes in the same dream as a different avatar in the dream. And they see one another, talk to one another. There is even a report of one alter clubbing the other over the head <laughs> with a baseball, uh, um, you know, whatever. Um, and, uh, and so each alter reports to the therapist afterwards the dream from its own perspective. And the other alters were other characters in the dream of each alter. Um, this was the validity of this phenomenon or the, the, the real existence of this has been questioned for over 100 years. But since the turn of the century with the neuroimaging technology, uh, all doubts have vanished. Uh, we, we can even now, because of research done here in the, in the Netherlands by Yolanda Schlumpf and, and her team, uh, we can even now diagnose the idea by looking at patterns of brain activity. In other words, there is something dissociation looks like on a brain scanner. It, it has an image uh, that, that on the basis of which you can apply an objective uh, diagnosis or research done seven years ago in Germany. Uh, there was this woman who had several alters and uh, two of the alters claimed to be blind. The woman was not blind. She could see perfectly. There was nothing wrong with her visual system. So the, the neuroscientist had this brilliant idea to instrument her with an EEG cap when a blind alter was in control. And lo and behold, there was no brain activity in the visual cortex, even though her eyes were open. So that's not something you can fake. And, and when the host personality would be in executive control again, brain activity would return uh, to the visual cortex. So dissociation happens. Wh whether we have a complete, uh, conceptual account of it or not, it happens in nature. It's a fact, and it does exactly decomposition. What it does is precisely to make one mind seem like it is many and interact with itself um, in dreams or even in the waking world. Um, so analytic idealism proposes that the solution to the decomposition problem is dissociation which is not a theoretical abstraction. It's not a process we're inventing and the community has to evaluate whether it's plausible for this process to exist or not. No, no, we don't need to do that. The process exists. It is happening every day with human beings. So the idea is to just extrapolate this thing we already know, extrapolate that something of exactly the same kind happens in the mind of nature. And these alters are created in the mind of nature. And how do we diagnose this? W what do these alters look like under a brain scanner? Well, it looks like life, biology, living beings. And we don't need a brain scanner because we don't need to peek through this skull. We are already in that mind. We are inside. We just need to look around. Where are the dissociated alters? Well, living, breathing, metabolizing creatures are what dissociated alters of the mind of nature look like when you observe them. Th that's the hypothesis. Well, that's wonderful to see that actually decombination happens. Now, um, we make the problem more difficult if we ask why does it happen? So for now, there is one thing which is important. First is it happens. Yes, great, it happens. If we look at the Big Bang theory or whatever the history of our universe, we're saying that actually this one consciousness, which is the idealist kind of reality, which I also believe in, 
very strongly and I have my logic about how it happens and why it happens. would love to discuss it another time with you, hopefully when I'm in the Netherlands, because often I am there. Uh, this, um, this one big consciousness suddenly splinters if we wanted to accept the, the uh, Big Bang theory and the 14 billion year old universe uh, that brought us to where we are today and evolutionary theory, etc. Be, albeit consciousness, yes, we know we have agreed upon that, but it does decombine or splinter into what looks like atoms and then molecules combining to form cells or combining to form, you know, planets and combining to form things and then ultimately growing into uh, a complex uh, organized nervous system, which is all consciousness anyway, but requiring certain dynamics of consciousness to be able to be meta-conscious. So therefore this splintering, this infinite division happens in a sequential way from nothingness almost, which is the beginning of time, and then builds up into a uh, human reality. So that is that is one observation and are we allowed to go into the telos of it why does it happen okay if I, if i was asked if i were asked this question during an analytic philosophy conference um, then my answer would be the, i'll give you two answers so the, the first is the answer i would give in an, an, an a technical conference i would say well the the time when the first altar formed in the mind of nature is exactly the time when the first living being arose in the universe because these two events are one and the same event life is the extrinsic appearance of dissociation and dissociation is what life feels from the inside private conscious inner life within the context of a broader world so these are not two events, they are the same. Abiogenesis is the event in question. How did the life arose from non-life? When and how? Uh, it's exactly the same as when and how the mind of nature dissociated for the first time and formed the first altar, because the first altar is the first living organism. And in that just, context, uh, just for clarification, sorry to interrupt. Are we, you use the term life and you use the term altar. Are we talking about life uh, form of what life form? Does it exclude trees? Does it exclude minerals? Uh, or when you mentioned life, you meant just existence of whatever? Well, minerals are not alive, right? Right. So, so I meant life. I meant uh, biology, metabolism. Biology. Okay. So, so you know, protein folding, DNA transcription, mitosis, right. ATP, so burning, all that good stuff. So we jumped directly to the altar. What happened in the early times of, of uh, the Earth and, I mean, the universe's evolutionary growth? And there was just the non-dissociated universal mind. And if one of us were to be there, we would have seen the physical universe in its state then. But of course, there was no one to look. So we cannot speak of the physical universe what we call the physical universe is a content of perception. There has to be someone to look. But the processes that would have underlay the physical world, then those existed. Those mental processes were there and they were not dissociated. The universe existed from a first person perspective before life ever arose. Um, so life, life as it arose and as we know it today, we are creating that history from our perspective today. But the actual happenings are a different story, practically, than what we are imagining or experiencing or the science is telling us. Yeah, we have theories about the past and those theories may be wrong. And I don't think they are completely wrong, um, but they are, they are not complete. We don't have all the details, otherwise we would have been able to induce a biogenesis in a laboratory, create life from non-life, and we never managed to, to this day. Do I believe that we will never manage to? No, I think a point will come in which we will be able to do that, to induce a biogenesis. That will be the point when we will be able to induce dissociation in the mind of nature. It's the same thing. So- um, Yeah, let's go back. Sorry, the interruption yeah. just was for clarifying for myself and to the listeners. 
where we are, what is the altar and living beings. Okay. So if you understand that the first dissociation in the mind of nature is a biogenesis, it's the same event uh, looked from within or looked from without, but it's the same event. Life, the first life and the first dissociation are the same event. If you understand that, then to ask the question, why did the mind of nature dissociation dissociated? It's the same question as to ask why life arose from non-life. So in a, in, an, in a technical conference, I would say it's the wrong question to ask because we don't ask why the volcano erupted. We don't ask why the star went supernova. This is just stuff that happens in nature because nature behaves according to certain patterns and regularities. We call them the laws of nature. And given enough time uh, and enough interaction, those patterns and regularities will eventually lead to the volcano erupting, the, the star going supernova, and life arising. So there is no need to have a, a premeditated reasoning. Uh, it's just stuff that spontaneously arises in nature, given enough time and given the regularities of nature's behavior. Now, so this this would be my official answer. If you put me against the wall with a gun on my head, that's the answer I, I would give. We you won't do that, but we're happy you gave the answer. <laughs> now, if I allow myself more poetic freedom, and I regard everything I know about nature with the totality of my psychic faculties and not only with my rational mind, my reasoning, my intellect, then it, the fact that metaconscious life arose on this planet is something that, that represents tremendous risk for the entire ecosystem. Because before metaconsciousness, all conscious beings behave according to the flow of instinct, which makes sure that the ecosystem remains harmonious, remains in equilibrium, in balance, for as long as all the participants are controlled by that impersonal flow of instinct that, or that transpersonal flow of instinct, harmony is guaranteed because there is no uh, individual initiative that separates itself from the whole. Instinct is, is a collective dynamics. Um, enforced by evolution. So the, the beginning of meta-consciousness is the moment when we disconnected from the flow of instinct and we brought risk to the entire ecosystem. We, we can end uh, uh, the ecosystems of planet Earth. Actually, we are very advanced in the process <laughs> of doing exactly that. Um, so it seems like a, an incomprehensible gamble Almost an anomaly in a sense. Yeah, an anomaly. How can a creature that evolved within the constraints of this ecosystem, according to fitness and natural selection, how can that creature suddenly detach from the flow of the instinct that brought it into being? Um, and even the history of this happening in humans is extremely puzzling. There is this book by Ian Tattersall from the American Museum of, of Natural History. He wrote this book called Masters of the Planet, I think is the name. And he shows that uh, all the evidence indicates that anatomically we exist exactly in the form we exist today. In other words, biologically, we are what we are today. Have, we have been that for about 200,000 years. But symbolic thinking, meta-consciousness, um, appeared about 30,000 years ago. In, in in an homo sapiens that was anatomically identical to all of its predecessors. So whatever the biology of metaconsciousness turns out to be, we don't understand it very well, but whatever it is, it was already there for about 170,000 years before it actually expressed itself. And if that is so, then it had no reason to evolve. Why would it evolve and then not be used for 170,000 years? Because actually, metaconsciousness is totally useless unless you have a, a culture and society. Um, because if you're going to stop to deliberate whether you should run away from the tiger or not, you're dead already. So uh, you react much quicker and efficiently to environmental challenges if you're instinctive. 
So this thing somehow appeared in nature for no reason. Ian Tartarsal says, the only reason we have to believe that such a step is possible at all, the only reason we have to believe that it is possible is that it actually happened. Because otherwise, it would be a lunatic hypothesis. It's completely great to it. So why? Why would nature do this? It's absurd. Why would something evolve, be fixed in the genome, and do nothing for 170,000 years, actually being counter to survival? Because if you start you know, thinking too much about things and then you are gone, it becomes only useful with the advent of agriculture, language, trade, and culture. How is this possible? So it seems that nature has a, quote, unnatural impetus to develop a capability in living beings that only brings risk to the rest of nature. Why the hell would it do that? And my poetic mind would say, well, there is a telos. It's not a premeditated plan by nature. It's not like nature in the beginning of time said, oh, I'm going to go about crafting a metaconscious creature now. That would already require metaconsciousness. So no, that would be begging the question. You're presupposing the very thing you're trying to explain. You know, it's circular reasoning, it doesn't work. Um, but there, it, it's conceivable that if nature is a mind, even if an instinctive mind, uh, it has certain proclivities. Um, you know, even a cat, which is not metaconscious, when it's hungry, it tries to find food. It didn't elaborate on a plan like, I am hungry now, and therefore I should feed myself, and therefore, no, 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 it doesn't happen. The cat is just pulled towards the food by instinct. I suspect nature is being pulled by instinct towards metacognition. And that's why it happened. And that's why it is such an incredibly risky gamble that nature took anyway. Wow. So that's that's very interesting. And um, if we go to Schopenhauer, then he had a different logic, if I am understood properly, that he actually uh, thought that meta consciousness liberates from the instinct. And that is one thing that that original consciousness might have somehow looked forward to, in a sense, to give us something more as if the creation of meta consciousness is an addition to something that was missing, which, of course, as you describe it, seems to be real. But is that a telos? Is that a goal that kind of says, fine, we now have humans and whatever creatures that can be metaconscious and therefore be liberated from the instinct. And I think you discussed this also, of course, in your decoding Schopenhauer and also a bit about uh, Jung's attitude about the archetypes and uh, you know the collective unconscious and that ultimately there is, is this transcendence and this uh, ultimate appearance of humans and their higher consciousness, which will fill something that wasn't existing at the, at the origin, if you like. Yeah, if you were, if you're not metacognizant, you are, you are basically uh, a prisoner to instinct. Um, and that ensures ecosystemic harmony, but it can lead to great pain uh, to yourself. Um, how, the, how can we how can I give people some intuition, some felt intuition about it? Um, imagine that we are um, deliriant. We are very ill, very high fever, and we are deliriant. Uh, in a delirium, we are not metaconscious. Actually, not even in dreams, we are metaconscious. We only metacognize dreams based on the mirror of memory after we wake up. There is research done about this, by the way. Um, if you cannot metacognize the flow of your own experiences, then you are a victim of your own experiences, which means that you cannot compartmentalize things, you cannot avoid thoughts that give you bad emotions, you cannot avoid fantasies and nightmares that make you suffer, nightmares that make you suffer. But when you are metacogn metacognizant or metaconscious, you can say, oh, that's a line of thought I don't want to explore or this is an image I don't want to imagine. 
um, you can protect yourself. Even your traumas, you can find a place for them, as we say in Dutch. And we find a place for our, for our traumas. It's like you open a little drawer and you put your trauma there in the drawer and you close it. And it didn't go away. You, you, you didn't kill it. It's there, but it, it has its place. That's what the metacognition uh, allows for. It allows, you, allows for you to make some order in your own conscious inner life and make certain choices to minimize your personal suffering. Of course, that takes you out of minimizing risk for the ecosystem, <laughs> because now you are optimizing for yourself, not for the ecosystem. And that's the origin of all you know, environmental destruction. That's exactly what we do. We optimize for ourselves, not for the ecosystem. That's the risky gamble of nature. But from an immediate first person perspective, it's very attractive because it gives you some tools to not torture yourself as much as you would otherwise do in a pure delirium. Um, so I think the mind of nature, when metaconsciousness arose and was used for the first time, the mind of nature was like, oh, we like that, you know? That's nice, you know, it, it gives us a grip, it gives us some kind of handle, uh, maybe we can reduce uh, self-imposed torture because, you know, the raw nature is a bloodbath. You know, m most animal species on this planet are, are, are predators, are carnivores. Not most individuals, but most animal species are, can only live by killing another. And that killing is, is not fast, swift, and painless. Well, cats take the crown for the swift, uh, the least painful kill <laughs> of other animals. Uh, but it's a bloodbath in your backyard, you know, ants are cutting up earthworms in pieces while they're still wiggling alive. I mean, it's a bloodbath in your, in your lawn. <laughs> um, and what is that? It's nature doing this to itself. Um, maybe nature doesn't want to do it to itself because it doesn't feel good. But you need metacognition in order to first recognize that it's you doing this to yourself before you can then stop. Um, you know, the, the right way to go, if you're hammering yourself in the head, the right way to go about it is to stop hammering instead of looking for a helmet. But to stop hammering, you need to be metacognizant. Without it, all you can do is try to look for a helmet. <laughs> um, so I think nature got a taste of it and it figured, yeah, that's the way to go. So we have then seen the pros and cons because the first answer took us to the cons of metaconsciousness, which puts nature in a, in a risk at risk of you know self annihilation, destroying the ecosystem, and what we see in climate change and uh, wars and all possibilities, and so that is kind of a risky thing that happened. Yet now we are looking at the upside of it, which is actually to maybe stop the bloodbath and live as humans live and create evolution of humanity and life and living and uh, experiencing more and kind of rising in consciousness to a level where even if we want to start calling the collective consciousness, the, the being together, which of course is different than the collective unconscious of Carl Jung and collective consciousness being the result of the consciousness of all individuals living together in a sense and creating some wholeness which is more than the sum of the parts whereas the collective unconscious is a pre-existing archetypes that actually influence the process. Now this brings to an important uh, reality do you do you feel archetypes are real like in that in that consciousness which is the starting point we're going back now to the original idealistic kind of consciousness what does it have in it does it have archetypes does it have already seeds of reality you know if we want to go to parmenides and ex nihilo nihil fit he would think well there is nothing that comes out of nothing and therefore either there is nothing and everything is in kind of an illusion 
or everything actually was existing before uh, things started to manifest or, you know, this kind of, of comparison. Yeah, I, I think the first important distinction is between nothing and no thing. Um, I, I think there is no thing outside mind or consciousness as a type of existence. Whatever is not mind, is not consciousness, it's just a theoretical abstraction we engender and it's not out there. Um, so there is no thing. But obviously reality is not nothing because even if it is all an illusion, then, then the illusion is something. Right. There is a difference between there being an illusion and there not being the illusion. An, an illusion is not nothing. Right. An illusion is no thing, but it's not nothing. Right. An illusion is perforce a manifestation of, of some kind of intrinsic potential in nature. There has to be something that can have the illusion or that can be the illusion. Um, and I think that's what's happening. I think there is no thing. And Parmenides was right in this sense. Uh, there is no thing. Um, but there is the inherent intrinsic potentiality for mental phenomena to develop. And we can be sure of that because there are mental phenomena happening. And um, they didn't just fall from nothingness. So I think to exist is to have properties. In other words, to exist is to be one thing instead of another. So you have the properties that characterize what actually exists. And it could be something else, but it's not because it has those properties and not those other properties. So to exist is to have properties. So, and that applies to mind. If mind exists, it has properties which define it as being mind as, as opposed to something else. And I think amongst those properties are the inherent dispositions mind has for certain patterns of behavior. In other words, that mind behaves in a certain way is an expression of its own intrinsic dispositions because otherwise it would behave in, a, in some other way, but it doesn't. It behaves in the way it does behave. So it has the dispositions it does. And we call those dispositions archetypes. It's just a word to refer to the intrinsic natural patterns of behavior of a mind. And you can apply that to human beings as Carl Jung did, or you can apply that to nature at large as Carl Jung did <laughs> as well. Um, so you can say that just as human minds, human minds have certain archetypes, pattern, the typical patterns of behavior, like the archetype of the mother, which is the nurturing pattern of behavior, or the archetype of the hero, which is that pattern of behavior that leads to risk taking in order to conquer some desired goal, uh, or the archetype of the shadow, which is those patterns of behavior that we don't recognize in ourselves and we are ashamed of. So th there are myriad archetypes, just as human minds have those intrinsic dispositions to behave itself in certain ways and not in others. I think the mind of nature is the same. And it's because the mind of nature has the archetypes it has. In other words, it's because the mind of nature is whatever it is that it is, um, that it behaves in a way that we call the Big Bang and the cosmos and galaxies, solar systems, planets, and monkeys walking around rocks. <laughs> That's beautiful. But then does it, is there a contradiction about this and the meta consciousness side? Because what about, I mean, a mother's archetype is quite a complex archetype. Uh, uh, Bernardo Castro is a fantastic archetype. Uh, and that archetype must have been there in the original consciousness, uh, if that is the case. And therefore, um, we cannot say that suddenly the appearance of Bernardo is an anomaly in the process of evolution that suddenly appeared and created something like that. If we are assuming that actually even the, that one consciousness, which is the beginning starting point, has all these archetypes already in it. Okay, the Jung provides an answer uh, to both the questions. You ask two questions. Um, Jung himself equated archetypes to instinct. 
In other words, you don't you do not need to think about how you're going to behave for you to express an archetype. It's instinctive. Another word for it would be it is spontaneous. It's a knee-jerk reaction to environmental cues because it's built into you. It's built into your mind. That's how you will spontaneously react given certain circumstances, certain contexts. That's what the archetypes are. In that sense, the archetypes are the very opposite of metacognition. The archetypes are, are what is there before we can even talk about re-representation, separating subject from object. Animals behave in purely archetypal manner. We call it instinct. They don't think it through. You know, if you, if you corner a cobra, the cobra will try to, hit, to, to bite you. The cobra didn't think it through. This is a human being. If I bite him, his village will come after me and kill me, so I better not bite him. No, no, no. It's, it's spontaneous. The cobra will just go and bite you if it feels threatened and cornered. Archetypes are spontaneous. A mother doesn't think about, you know, I will behave this and this way because my baby needs milk. No, it's spontaneous. So to be archetypal is the opposite of to be metacognizant. Um, and, and that's why the archetypes are so powerful. Uh, because they express themselves prior to our ability to filter them out through reasoning, metacognitive reasoning. Uh, and this is so bad that we now turned metacognition uh, to the role of servant to the archetypes. And that's when things become really, really dangerous. That's when you build a nuclear bomb, uh, because then your archetypal idea that you should have control and you should earn territory, conquer territory, and you should annihilate your enemies. These are all archetypal ideas. Now comes metacognition to serve that instinctive urge. But going, going back to the, to the two answers. So that's the first answer. To be archetypal is, is in a sense the opposite of to be metacognitive. Now, the complexity of the archetypes. Okay, Jung himself in life warned against the fallacy of equating an archetype to a manifestation of the archetype. So Jung explained this using the metaphor uh, of a crystal. He said, you know, if you look at a crystal that forms spontaneously in nature, you will see that the molecules in that crystal are arranged according to a very precise, repetitive 3D structure. The crystal matrix, that's what we call it. Um, and then he says, we can speak of the crystal matrix, of that pattern of arrangement of molecules, even before a crystal formed. Because, and even before the first crystal formed, you could say that the crystal matrix was latent in the laws of nature. Because when the first crystal formed, that crystal matrix was a manifestation, was a, a, um, a result of the unfolding of the laws of nature. So there is a sense in which you could say that the, the crystal matrix was there as a pattern even before the first crystal formed. And that's what you mean by the archetype. It's the pattern, not the embodiment. Uh, a crystal is not the archetype. A crystal is a manifestation of the archetype. In, in Jung's words, he said, an archetype as it is in itself is empty. The archetypes are empty. So Bernardo is not an archetype. Uh, the complexity of the world we see around us today, they are not archetypes. They are archetypal. They are expressions of those archetypes, those templates implicit uh, uh, in the regularities of nature, the laws of nature, if you will, um, that were there in a sense from the beginning before they ever were manifested. So a lot of the richness and complexity we see around is the compound result of archetypal manifestations, but you can't take any specific instance and say that's an archetype. No, no, no. For the same reason that you cannot say that any specific crystal is the crystal matrix. You yes. see what I mean? Yeah, this is this is uh, brilliant. It's really beautiful. This is Jung. It's not me, huh? The, yeah, but, but you have deciphered it, decoding, okay. <laughs> decoding all of this. Well, actually, it, it brings me to an experience that myself I've had, and I, I hope you know you, you you have a few minutes to to hear that. When I you know first came to the Netherlands, uh, 
and met Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. I don't know if you've heard of Maharishi, who is the yeah, founder of the Transcendental Meditation Program. This is what uh, you know. I've been kind of uh, inspired in, in consciousness and all that. Uh, I've met him already in the 1980s, but in 1990, I came to be with him and work with him and look at the ancient Vedantic knowledge and Veda and all of this aspect. And in the early 1990s, he asked me to make a comparison between the Vedic literature, Veda is an old literature, Veda, Veda is a term that means knowledge in the ancient uh, Sanskrit. And there is a literature, which is a huge literature that has metaphors and, um, you know, philosophy and poetry and, and, and all kinds of things. But he looked at it as a structure of consciousness. And what he said is that consciousness has a dynamic and that dynamic can be accessed by our awareness if we go deep within ourselves and transcend. This is a theme that you also explore beautifully in Essentia, that you explore in more than allegory because the myths that you bring out and beautifully described all the surprise that you have from these simple people. And actually, we started our talk a little bit with that, how they can actually cognize uh, rather than intellectually analyze something and they create these myths that actually represents uh, some truth about even what you have thought through reasoning and analysis and science and understanding about the mechanics of life and the fact that there is consciousness at the beginning and how consciousness you know enters into itself and how the dynamics of consciousness emerge so to make a long story short uh, is something really fascinating Marishi felt that all the Vedic literature is actually like that, just a cognition of the laws of nature, which we are just mentioning. The dynamics of the crystal before the crystal appears, the dynamics of nature and archetypes before they even come to being. And he said, though, that these are actually the foundations of even what we see as our human structure, which allows us to have metacognition and even to transcend and experience higher states of consciousness than just mere experiencing. So we rise from simple consciousness to higher and higher states of consciousness, which we can discuss another time if you wish. But all being said is that all these sayings about humans being in the image of God or the kingdom of heaven is within you, or in the Vedic terminology, you are Brahman, you are the Veda, you are totality. For him, it was because we have some special structure of the dynamics of consciousness, which is our human body. And if the Veda is also that in its structure and function, then these two should resemble each other. It's like saying there is a literature, but the literature is quite deep and representing some dynamics in nature, which are very fundamental. And if those dynamics are really fundamental, they should resemble something that is also of a higher quality, of a higher value of consciousness, which is our dynamics of our body. So what he asked me to do is to look. I was just coming out of Harvard and MIT. I had my PhD in brain science, brain and cognitive science, and did my neurology and like that. I was very much into the brain and all its details. It was kind of, for me, just an unbelievably unexpected, if you know, to say the least, kind of trying to compare two things. Now, I did go into this very carefully. And believe it or not, uh, a book came out of this. I found an exact correlation between the structure and function of the Vedic literature and the structure and function of the human physiology. In what way? Let's take an example just for illustration. There are 40 aspects of the Vedic literature. One of them, for example, is called, let's say, Nyaya. Nyaya has a quality of distinguishing and deciding. And what 
Marisha explains is that it is seeing the specific versus seeing the holistic. They call it the lamp at the door, which means it is able to see the specific values from one side and the holistic value on the other side, sees the outside and sees the inside. That's the lamp at the door. Now, he said, find the place in the nervous system or in the body that has this quality and look at its structure and see what is the structure of this literature is, which has five chapters and 16 topics. So, you know, maybe it comes to your mind that one of the aspects of our nervous system that looks out and in is the thalamus, which is sitting in the middle of the brain. It gets all the sensory information, sends it to the cortex, which puts it together to create a holistic perspective of specific input that come to the brain. So the thalamus is that quality. Now, when you look at the thalamus, it's divided into five sections that are very clearly de determined. And it has 16 uh, nuclei in it that actually have the same function as those 16 values that are described in Nyaya. And so for me, it was absolutely astonishing and very profound because this is only one example and it might sound outlandish, but as I looked at it and looked at it and looked at the different values, I really found that actually our consciousness and our physical structure, if we look at them from this both dynamics, are the same. And so since you're talking about this, I thought I'd share this with you since I have the opportunity. <laughs> I, I can't comment specifically on this case because I just don't know enough about Vedic uh, literature, but uh, I, I can comment in general. Um, I think if you look at complexity science, the, the study of complexity and variety in nature, um, what you find is that um, incredibly varied and rich dynamics can emerge from extremely simple rules. Um, in other words, complexity may be a byproduct of extraordinary simplicity. Uh, if you apply very simple rules recursively, in other words, you apply them, you get a result, then you apply the same rule to the result again, and then again to the result of that, and you keep doing this, essentially you're not doing anything different, you're just applying the same rules over and over and over again. But if you do that, the complexity that emerges in many cases is just mind boggling. And that may be the secret of um, the universe because we can write today uh, the, the basic equations of the fundamental laws of physics. They are not complete yet. We know there is a glaring hole between you know, relativity and quantum uh, field theory that we know has to be closed. You can put everything we do know, write all of those questions in about half a page, legible, readable. Um, and somehow out of that comes the unspeakable variety of galaxies and solar systems and stars and planets and, you know, and storms and volcanoes and life and ecosystems, trees, you know, tigers and human beings creating rockets. I mean, it's just mind boggling, but we know from, from complexity science that that's exactly what you would expect. Very simple rules leading to enormous complexity. And it so happens that a particular subset of the possible simple rules is particularly apt at creating mind boggling complexity as a result. And we call that subset fractal rules like the Boltzmann brain, for example. <laughs> the Boltzmann... no, that, that is just an, uh, uh, it's a thought experiment about right. quantum fluctuations, but uh, fractals are very complex uh, geometrical objects generated by incredibly simple rules. Um, and a characteristic of these uh, rules, these fractal rules, is not only that they create a lot of complexity, but another characteristic of it is that there are internal self-similarities within that complexity. In other words, the same pattern repeats itself over and over again at different levels and in different places. Like um, um, 
the blood vessel structure, the capillaries that go into our lungs, uh, they are fractal. And the river delta systems are fractal too. They look like <laughs> the capillaries yeah. that go into the lungs. And why? One thing has nothing to do with the other, but that's the characteristic of fractals. So if nature is generated by some very simple rules that you may call the archetypes, you may call them archetypes. They are archetypal patterns of behavior, very, very simple. And if the whole complexity of nature has evolved from these very, very simple archetypal patterns, then we have reasons to believe that those patterns were fractal in essence. And therefore, we have an account for why two completely unrelated things tend to be similar, because they are just the recursive application of those very simple fractal archetypal patterns. And I just thought of that when you talked about the similarity of the Talmuds and uh, the literary literary structure of the Vedas. Yeah, it's, it's the same rules. And in that sense, you could say humans are self-similar to the divinity because it, that's what the, the Bible says, right? Man was created in the image of God. That's code for archetypal, fractal archetypal patterns, the basic laws of nature being very simple, the laws of the divinity, uh, and their recursive application leads to self-similarity because that's what fractals do. You, know, you can yeah. run that in your computer and convince yourself that that's what happens. Yeah. I did that. That's what happens. Oh, really? So man is created in the image of God and so are the Vedas. <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> really brilliant. Uh, although, of course, the kind of uh, entity you end up with, which means those fractals have different levels of organization and complexity, but the kind of level of complexity and orderliness or whatever organization leads to a different kind of experience, such as one of them being metaconscious and uh, some of them rising into maybe higher consciousness than uh, being metaconscious, which could be, for example, you know, I am conscious of the environment always and I'm conscious that I'm conscious, but am I conscious of myself? always and can i be always conscious of myself as pure consciousness rather than a wave in the lake but the actual lake at the same time when i'm conscious of the objects and the outside you know we can start building layers of consciousness and meta meta consciousness uh, on that level and this will be kind of a reflection of what the fractals have ended up with at what level of complexity and how they are organized. We certainly have no reason to think that uh, we have reached the end of this recursive application of uh, fractal archetypes. Uh, we have absolutely no reason to think that. So it is entirely conceivable, I would say extremely likely that this will continue on and and to a degree that may be impossible for us to conceive as human beings with the cognitive apparatus that evolution has given us at this point. It may... Yeah, beautiful. Um, I didn't want to interrupt. I just took a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think it's entirely conceivable. Um, we have to keep in mind the distinction Jung made between the archetype and a manifestation of the archetype. Uh, whatever the advanced end state might be of this recursive application of natural laws. Um, it exists in potentiality in the archetypes, but it doesn't need to exist in actuality because the actuality is an expression of the archetype. So you don't need the crystal to be there to speak of the crystal matrix as an archetypal pattern. So to say that we may, that, may end up with a level of consciousness that is not even conceivable to us today, I, I think is entirely reasonable. And it may have to do with the instinctive telos of nature. That's where nature is trying to go. But that doesn't mean that in the beginning, if we can speak of beginnings, that that level of consciousness was already there in actuality. It certainly was there in potentiality, otherwise it could never be there in the future. Uh, but in actuality, maybe it was not there. And to speak of Attilos, we are almost presupposing that it 
isn't there in the beginning in actuality, because otherwise the tulus is already realized from the get go. There is not nowhere to go to. You are already there when yeah. you start it, right? So it's important to make this distinction between the potentiality, which has to be there all along, and the actuality, which may be something that only comes with strenuous, strenuous unfolding and recursive application of these archetypal patterns. In other words, the ultimate divinity may be something that will follow up from us. And that ultimate divine mind was there in the beginning as a potentiality, but in actuality, it may actually depend on us. And that's quite a sobering thought, I think. That is wonderful. I mean, potentiality can be just imagination. So that consciousness can imagine it and, and think of it as a possibility even though not actualized, I mean, we can, we can take that as one supposition. We don't want to go back to that, but it will be another discussion of what actually the ideal consciousness is, which means when we say idealism and define that primary consciousness, are we putting limits on it? Or we're saying it's a field of all possibilities that already has within it all potentialities, even imagining everything, but not yet actualizing things, and then allowing actual existence and to exist in a material manifest way, allowing that to actualize that which in the uh, original ideal consciousness is only a potential imagination, if you like, or, or some kind of uh, uh, ideas, uh, you know, like Plato's ideas, archetypes of, uh, you know, Jung, etc that can be more, much more complex than just uh, an instinctive even archetypes, even though that's what uh, you know, Carl Jung defines. But we can imagine, as we now imagined, that it, potentialities can be there and potentialities of higher consciousness. And it's beautiful that you said it's sobering because that means we as an evolutionary, on an evolutionary path, we can actually get to something bigger and higher and get our cons of meta consciousness to become all pros if we guide ourselves in the right direction this is where it comes to the practical level of the importance of consciousness and that we need to do something about it and can we do something about it and that brings us to all the ancient traditions uh, and whatever guidance we have from people who are of higher consciousness even you know sages and, and uh, saints and knowers of reality and in particular in in my case uh, my interest uh, exploring transcendence exploring transcendental consciousness exploring technologies from the ancient knowledge of veda and yoga and all of that that actually can channel us uh, and our meta consciousness to be guiding us towards those higher levels and so we have something we can do about it now that we have our consciousness and we know it's risk our meta consciousness does have risks and we see them in the wars we see them in the pandemics uh, created we see them in the struggles and the people fighting each other we see those cons and they are there but we also see the beautiful human qualities that are of coming together of supporting each other of creating beautiful things of allowing us to communicate of allowing us to understand the universe of protecting ourselves and therefore we can actually play the role that guides us towards higher consciousness and then responsibly save our planet uh, by rising in awareness yeah, I think we we not only can, I think we have the moral responsibility um, to do that because there's nothing else out there in nature that has the capability to pass value judgments. Uh, only we have that capability. And that means that now we are responsible for it too, not only capable of, but responsible for. Um, I think, you know, instinct alone is uh, inherently harmonious and good. Um, meta consciousness, when it's not serving instinct, it also stands to be inherently harmonious and, and a, a positive anti-entropic force uh, in nature. The problem is when 
the capability of meta consciousness goes in the service of instinct that's when you have a very very dangerous situation because now your instinct is telling you i want to mate with the prettiest healthiest woman um, i want to conquer my enemies i want to uh, accumulate all resources i could possibly imagine i will ever need and now i'm going to apply my metacognition the nuclear weapon of nature right. uh, towards serving those instinctive uh, uh, proclivities and tendencies that's where you have uh, a mixture of sodium and water it's explosive yeah um and, and we can literally blow this rock up uh, yeah. with this mixture i don't think it is possible to solve this by going back to instinct some eastern traditions suggest that you know you have to ab abandon um uh, meta -con uh, consciousness altogether go back to sort of purely in the moment instinctual way of being i don't think that's possible Beautiful. I don't think that's even biologically possible. I think the only way forward is is what in military jargon is called a, a forward escape. The only way to escape is to go all the way <laughs> in that <laughs> direction of meta consciousness to a point where it's no longer just serving instinct. Beautiful. To a point where your value judgment is now for the benefit of the whole as opposed to the benefit of that individual, which is what instinct is doing. Instinct benefits the whole by focusing on the individual, but it, it doesn't have the nuclear weapon of meta consciousness. That's why it works. If you give it a nuclear weapon, it's a recipe for disaster. It's just like giving your kid a machine gun. You know, that, it, being a kid is great. It's safe, harmonious, <laughs> harm will never be done. Being a responsible adult with a machine gun is, is, is okay. You know, you, it's used for defense, uh, maybe for hunting is also okay, but you don't give the machine gun to a kid. It's that combination that is explosive. And, and, and it is the combination we have today. We can never part with the machine gun. It's, it, it has grown in us. It's part of us. But we can try to mature and become an adult and not a kid. And I think that's the only way we have. It's to very, very quickly mature because we live in a very adolescent culture in a very adolescent society and we are equipped with the machine gun nature run that risk nature has given us the machine gun closed its eye and hoped for the best <laughs> and now we will see what will come out of that we either will mature or we will machine gun each other and the rest of the planet you know the jury is out it's absolutely brilliant and that's why we need you and and great thinkers like you and we need essentia and it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, more you know raison d'etre and uh, all the all that you are doing and we are thinking about and uh, really i mean i think those who have understood that bringing back to nature of the of the kind of animal nature which means uh, going back to the hypothalamus and the you know the the limbic system rather than you know the more advanced brain and for you know frontal cortex thinking about the future which are the uh symbolic representation of dynamics of consciousness we know they are not the real thing uh, is a misunderstanding it is really a higher consciousness means to transcend uh, beyond the the basic instincts and reach a bigger perspective of reality and understand things from a meta-meta consciousness. It's really rising in consciousness. And that is really what, what the rising in consciousness means. It doesn't mean just go back to your basic instincts, but of course there are many interpretations that go in all directions. One of the reasons why uh, actually there is a problem in, in the way you, you, not in the way you have presented, one of the reasons the problem arises is also because of physicalism, which, you know, which puts consciousness as almost nothing or as a product of the physical, and therefore go back to saying everything that we have to do and everything that we have to solve is to be solved just on the surface physical level, and therefore it leads to a certain kind of moral predisposition and perception of reality, perception of meaning, perception of telos, 
that is mixed up and doesn't lead us even from that perspective to the best uh, decision making process uh, you know particularly now there's artificial intelligence coming and i know you have looked into that and you look into that carefully and its potential danger if it is going to subserve the instincts the basic instincts and the domination etc so this is a, a whole entire topic but there is a practical value to what you are doing there is a practical value to bringing to light the importance of consciousness and that consciousness is primary and that it is through consciousness that we can make a difference today it is we've reached a certain level of consciousness where we can make decisions we have better channel our consciousness in the right way because this is what will allow us to be stronger than the artificial intelligence and stronger than the basic survival instincts and uh a tribal kind of uh, perspective in terms of survival so i feel there is a very practical value not just a theoretical understanding to our discussion and to the perception of what consciousness is what life is what ultimate reality is what's the meaning of things and how we can channel it absolutely i think uh, whether we know it or not um the story, the narrative we tell ourselves about who we are, what the world is, and what's going on, it uh, it shapes our choices, it shapes our thinking, uh, our way of life, how we go about things, and it can shape it in a um, dysfunctional way or in a functional way. Um, there are, of course, social, political, and psychological reasons for materialism to have arisen and come to dominate the world as it does uh, still today, although it's already changing. It's been about two, 150 years uh, of this. There is a reason why it happened. It didn't happen out of nothing. It, it can be understood how a civilization that fancies itself to be so advanced as ours can make such a very, very primary rookie mistake uh, as the narrative of materialism. It can be understood how it was at all possible and why it happened. Um, but regardless of that, materialism is a very... It, it as a narrative it's not only wrong because it could be wrong and harmless yeah. um, but it's wrong and very dysfunctional now if it were true and dysfunctional I, I would also say well it's the reality so let's bite the bullet right i'm, I'm yeah. my commitment is to truth uh, above all um, and if the price is high then we pay the price it's true uh, or you could say well it's not true but it's also harmless so yeah let the kids entertain themselves with their fantasies uh, the problem is when it isn't true, so we don't need to pay the price for it, and the price is very high, and, and, and that's our situation. It's this, this the terrible combination. Um, if you think that matter is all that really exists and endures, and mind is just transitory, then of course your suffering is all for nothing, because even if you acquire tremendous insight into human nature, into nature, the world, as a consequence of all of your suffering, if your mind disappears when you die, though, though, then those insights disappear with it. And ultimately, it's already for nothing now. Because if it's going to come to an end, then there is a very important sense in which it's already ended. Uh, yeah. It's already valueless. Um, and, and that's what we think. Um, and if matter is the only thing that truly endures, then what other purpose there can be in life other than to accumulate material stuff? Because everything is mat. Matter is right, the only thing that right. continues. So, you know, you, the purpose of life is to earn enough money to buy the next pair of shoes. Exactly. You know, <laughs> or that bigger car. Um, and of course, people who succeed in this very quickly come to the realization that they are chasing a ghost. That, you know, they buy all this stuff and then they are still unhappy. Uh, but most people don't even get the opportunity to have that realization because they don't get to buy the next pair of shoes. So they die thinking that the solution to all problems was to buy that pair of shoes and they just failed at it. And, and that's a tragedy. How many people meet their deaths this way? Beautiful. O only to realize immediately afterwards that that was not at all what was I going on. But, you know, it, it, it's an opportunity that um, is not used to the best uh, um, of its possibilities. And um, 
our understanding of the meaning of the world is calibrated by that because under materialism, matter is what there is. There is nothing behind it. There is no extra dimension of meaning, depth, and significance. And, and if you understand the world as an idealist understands, then, then matter is now a surface appearance. It's a symbol. It's pointing to something behind and beyond itself. It literally has meaning in the semantic sense. It, it must be deciphered. It's the superficial appearance of a whole dimension, a whole depth, uh, extra dimension of meaning and, and profundity. Um, and life now becomes a great adventure in, in the heart of the mystery. Is a look around. This is nature as it's presenting yourself to you. What does it mean regarding the essence of nature? What is behind this? Where is it leading to? What is it trying to do? And uh, now, what does it mean in a literal, literal, literal and figurative sense? So life gets reinvested with that dimension of mystery and, and, and meaning, which is always there, in fact. It's always there because whatever is going on, it's what is true. And we are in the middle of it and part of it. But when we don't see it because of a misformed narrative that arose because of social, political, and psychological reasons, and which has very little to do with reason and evidence, then it's a pity because we suffer more than we needed to. We achieve less than we could have because of this, uh, frankly, uh, nonsensical and absurd and untenable narrative of materialism. It's really, we're living a time now with you and all the thought about consciousness where it's really similar to the revolution of, you know, Galileo's and Copernic, uh, which changed the perception about reality and Einstein, which, you know, resolved a different perspective on, on, on time, on space, and quantum mechanics. So thank you so much for your time. You spent uh, this time with us. There is so much we can discuss about. I know you have uh, you know, lots of understanding about time, about space, how they emerge, what is their concept, and about myths and allegories and uh, how they are and the relationship between all of this. Uh, would you like to say something just before we close? I, I think what you described now about what we are doing, the work we are doing and who we are, I, we live in a culture that is so wrong that um, when somebody says the obvious, it looks like extraordinary. It looks fantastic, yeah. enlighten, enlightening. But given the role you have, I'm pretty sure that you do know that none of this is Bernardo and that uh, and none of this is spectacular. Uh, that is a basic recognition of what, what is right in front of our eyes. It's just that we live in such a degree of delusion that the obvious has become a great scientific discovery. <laughs> and uh, the, that in itself, it says something about the culture uh, we are in. And it's even possible that history will record all this in the terms you used, but I'm pretty sure that you and I know that that's not at all uh, something to beat your chest and, and be proud of. But I mean, and it's not even us <laughs> doing this, uh, but anyway. So wonderful. I'm sure you know that. So I'm not yes. going to protest too much and try that's to enlighten beautiful. you in this regard. <laughs> no, that is an, another additional layer of your grandness to see that actually it is consciousness working through us. Since everything is consciousness, we are consciousness, but somehow it is fine. It is great to accept to be the instrument of consciousness that brings light and enlightenment rather than guides into darkness. So in all humility, <laughs> we accept that. And we look forward actually to the time when, and I hope soon we should start this, you know, talking in these terms where it's not the hard problem of consciousness. Consciousness is a fact. We should yeah. start talking about resolving the hard problem of physicalness because consciousness is all we have. Consciousness is for sure something we experience. Without it, we don't have anything. And yet how this material world emerges. So let's, you know, let the scientists and the thinkers try to resolve where matter comes from, if it ever comes from somewhere <laughs> other than consciousness. So 
resolve the problem and the hard problem of physicalness because the hard problem supposedly of consciousness is already resolved and thanks to your work and all the thinking that has happened. Thank you so much for being with us uh, so uh, long and uh, we look forward to even more discussions and thinking and advancing that reality uh, and making it known to everyone. Sure, it's been a pleasure and an honor, Tony. Thanks for having me. A great pleasure and an honor to me also.